Whether we are there or not, ITSP Magazine still gets the best stories. Plenty of conferences and events spark our curiosity and allow us to start conversations with some of the world's brightest minds. In person or virtually, Sean Martin and Marco Cipelli go on location and sit down with them at the intersection of technology, cybersecurity, and society. Together, we discover what the synergy of these three elements means for the future of humanity. ThreatLocker is a zero-trust endpoint protection platform, providing enterprise-level cybersecurity to organizations globally. With ThreatLocker, you only allow only what you need and block everything else, including ransomware. Learn more at ThreatLocker.com. Marco. Sean, can you see the sunset on my face? <laughs> is that what that is? California I, coast. I thought you were being right interrogated. There. I know. <laughs> It's such a decision <laughs> that is going down on it's this on, side of the on, world. It's on this, yeah, it's the opposite side of me. I don't yeah, know. Give, give it a minute. I'll go away. People yeah, that yeah. are listening to the podcast, the audio, they don't need to. They don't, they don't need to worry about that. They don't want to see us either. That's the other thing. <laughs> that's, a, that's a smart <laughs> choice anyway. That's right. Well, but if they're there, if they are listening and not watching, they don't know who is our guest. They don't, they don't know, know who the guest is yet. And this is, uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it in suspense for a moment. Because we're on our way to Melbourne in Australia mm -hmm. for the Australian Cyber Conference 2025 there in Melbourne. 19 years that thing's been running. Our first time going. A great lineup of folks, one of which is a keynote speaker. And uh, I'll say a good friend of ours. He's been on the show a couple of times. Joe Sullivan, there he is. How are you, Joe? Hey, I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. I'm coming to you from tomorrow because I'm already in <laughs> Sydney. So the sun you see is the sun that's coming up into the sky. That's can right. You, can you give me the down. lottery ticket? <laughs> <laughs> exactly. You can tell us what the weather is anyway. Yeah. I think it's going to be warmer than California, Marco, in, uh, in Sydney. It's, it's approaching summertime. Great weather. Excited for the event. Excited to uh, hear all the all the presentations and uh, connect with people and have some great conversations. Joe, uh, I don't know. Have you, have you spoken in Australia before? Yeah, this is my second visit to Australia. I came uh, about a little more than a decade ago, uh, came to do meetings with a uh, government. I spent some time here in Sydney and spent some time in Canberra, the nation's capital. That's right. Very nice. Very nice. And this year you're speaking at uh, AU CyberCon and uh, you're going to talk about all kinds of fun things, which we're going to get into in a moment. Um, of course, the the folks that follow us regularly know who you are, I would say. Um, and uh, hopefully they've listened to our, our episode. Yeah, one was from Black Hat when we talked a little bit more in depth about uh, your experiences over the past few years. Uh, for the folks in the APJ, APAC region, um, let's share a bit about your past, your history, some of the roles you've had, some of the, what I air quotes, fun you've had <laughs> over the past few years in the roles that you had, uh, just kind of set the stage. Cause I think a lot of, a lot of what you'll be talking about on stage will be rooted in the experiences you've had and, and how to bring things forward for uh, security leaders. So I'll take it away, Joe. Yeah. Thanks. Uh, it's funny. A lot of people, when they look at my uh, career progression they refer to it as like a jenga pile because uh, it's a little bit all over the place and uh it probably ties to the, some of the career advice i give people which is I, i've always tried to just take the next step into something that looked interesting and that would keep me challenged and excited to get to work so when i was back in school uh, i went to i went to college i went to law school I planned to be a lawyer for my whole career, and I planned to go work for the government for my career. And I did that for the first eight years. I went into the U.S. Department of Justice, and I was very fortunate. Uh, it was the mid-1990s. Uh, I was the person who convinced the Department of Justice to give them an internet connection directly to their desk. And it was not easy in 1995 to do that. I wasn't allowed to connect my government computer to it, but I could get internet at my desk at a time when I couldn't get internet at home. And so I um, 
started doing uh, technology related things as a lawyer for the government. And before you know it, I was a full time cybercrime prosecutor in Silicon Valley. And I got into that role at the end of 1999, which people recall was the dot com boom. So everybody else was moving to Silicon Valley to be part of all the startups and make lots of money. And I moved there to be a government lawyer. You're, you're there with open arms. <laughs> and, and, I, and I went, yeah, and I went around asking uh, everyone, "Hey, uh, tell me about the cybercrime that's happening at your companies." And they all said, oh, "There's there's nothing bad happening here. Move along." And uh, that was the start of kind of my last 25 years working at the intersection of kind of the government and technology companies trying to deal with cybercrime and the challenges there. Uh, in 2002, I, I left uh, government and went over to eBay and uh, built out and ran their fraud investigations team. Uh, after doing that, I think for four years, I kind of said, should I go back to being a lawyer? And I moved over to the PayPal side. That was a time when eBay and PayPal were under the same corporate umbrella. And I ran the North America legal team at PayPal for a couple of years, but couldn't stop doing the cybersecurity stuff. Even at PayPal, I worked on and helped push out our responsible disclosure policy, which the people who know about bug bounty programs know that responsible disclosure came before bug bounty. And I think PayPal was the first company to push out a policy like that. Um, in 2008, I kind of followed my excitement about what was happening in Silicon Valley, and I went over to Facebook. Facebook was smaller than MySpace when I joined. A couple hundred people. We didn't even have a, a building. We were in just lots of little um, rented um, kind of suites along this one street in Palo Alto. And uh, pretty quickly started working on privacy and security things there. And before you knew it, they asked me to be the chief security officer of the company, which I did for six years. So built the security team at Facebook from, I think, four or five people to four or five hundred and was there through till the company was built into what we know as Meta now. You know, During my time there, we acquired Instagram. Uh, we acquired WhatsApp. We acquired Oculus, which is the virtual um, reality uh, business now. And... Then in 2015, uh, it seemed like it was it had turned into a big company and was kind of settling down. Uh, I didn't know what was going to happen in 2016, and you know Cambridge Analytica and the, um, all the uh, challenges around election related content. Um, but uh, I left in 2015 and went over to another company that needed someone to build a security team from scratch, and that was Uber. So I got to Uber in the spring of 2015. And there I built uh, a second time a security team from two or three people to several hundred people. Um, people know a bit about my Uber story. Uh, I uh, reported to the CEO, Travis Kalanick, and uh, in 2017, he was essentially forced out of the company. Those of us who were there reporting to him, we became co-CEOs for a few months. We just, the nine of us had to run the company without a CEO. And uh, with a little help from the board, we hired a, a new CEO and not too long after he fired me and uh, and put out a, and the company put out a story that I had been involved in a cover up of a security incident. Um, the following spring, after kind of going into my um, hermit phase for a few months and growing a beard and being pretty scary to my kids, hovering around them all the time. I, uh, I got back out of the house and I went over to Cloudflare, which was a, a small private company back then. And for the third time, I built a security team from three or four people to, and got to be um, there. You know, Cloudflare grew up, uh, we IPO'd, and I ended up leaving in the fall of uh, 2022 after more than four years there. So three times I've, I've built companies from, uh, security organizations from almost nothing to pretty large. And I, and I spent a lot of time mentoring security leaders and um, I, I set up my own LLC uh, security consulting and advising business. I advise, I think a dozen small startup companies now. And um, I do consulting probably one or one to three companies at a time for larger companies. You know, you, you were in security when it wasn't even a thing. 
right? <laughs> like you mentioned, like the MySpace, and it was the beginning of the internet, and and the fact that you built pretty much three company from few hundred, few few actually a handful of people into, I mean, really big big company. Uh, I guess you got so much to share. Is that uh, something that you're gonna touch on on your presentation and in Australia, and Melbourne? Yeah. That's almost exactly right. That's it. The the profession. I knew it. No, I didn't. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But look, the the profession is so young. It's so different from any other executive function in corporations. If we stop the CFO of ten companies and say, "Hey, tell us the career journey," like my kid wants to be a CFO. If you ask ten CFOs they'll give you variations of the same things that you should do. This is what you should major in. This is where you should intern. When you go inside, you, inside a company, you should work over an fp &A. You should be a business partner. You need to know how to do this math, et cetera. Uh, and if you ask 10 security executives, hey, I want to be a CISO, CISO, CSO, you know, one of the different many chief digital risk officer, we, we, don't, we don't even align on title. Uh, at this point, uh, we don't align on scope of responsibilities. We don't align on so many different things. And we have to grow up as a profession if we want to be taken seriously by the other executives and if we want to get the kind of structured protections that the other executives have. And so uh, we're at, I think, a really important time in the profession because, let's be honest, a whole new set of digital risks are coming at us right now in in and I think regulators and governments around the world are also at this point where they're like, we've been hands off on cybersecurity for a long time. And, you know, it's not like it's not it's not good enough. And, and I think we would all agree, like our cybersecurity world, we're not doing enough to protect the the the, you know, the least ready to to venture on to technology. I have, I have so many questions, um, two in particular that I. I feel I want to separate, but I can't. <laughs> and it's it's around the you, you touched on it a little bit, and and we've talked a lot about it on on my show. Uh, just the the pressure and the weight and the responsibility of the CISO uh, to the business, and and then now legally, uh, at least in the U.S. And so that's part of the question: what the current state of that, in your opinion? And then the second part of the question, we can we can talk about them separately if you want. But the second part of the question, because one of the things we like about when we travel to Asia, for example, uh, in the Pacific region, is kind of the differences in policy and laws and culture that change the game for how people live their lives, how they run their business, how they protect their business, the role of the CISO in in that world. So what differences do you see and will you perhaps touch on in your keynote again bringing back to the weight of the role here in the u.s compared to what you see happening in, in other regions specifically apj yeah it's interesting about a year ago i um did my first kind of post uber situation international talk in london and since then i've well, I guess I've, in the last year or so, I've spoken in Israel, London, um, uh, Norway, Denmark, <laughs> Switzerland, here in Australia. Uh, I've been, and every time I go to these conferences, I don't just kind of pop in, do my session and leave. I try and spend the whole, I try and go to the whole conference because um, I, I really enjoy connecting with security people because and one of the things I find is that we're 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 the same all over the planet, and I will say that the risks for the executives are the same too. It's funny when I was in I was in Denmark last month uh, for a conference for Deloitte, and I reached out to some people I'd met in Norway when I'd been there a couple of months before, who I knew lived in Copenhagen, and they uh, two of them arranged for just a random. A group of security people let's all meet up in a pub uh, on a free night that i had in copenhagen and it ended up being f me and about 40 people 
including a bunch of people who were getting the, all the planners for Copenhagen B-sides, which were happening the next week. And so they were deep in like talking about that. And it was no different than, you know, last month when I was in Dallas, hanging out with a bunch of security leaders at, at, at something completely different. There are definitely uh, um, differences in say, you know, when I talk about, like, I think that there, I think that we, we need some smart regulation because there's, the security leaders of the world are struggling right now to get the resources they need. And if you look at, if you look at the regulated industries and the regulated countries, the security leaders in those, in those places and func in categories get more funding. It's, it's a lot harder to go convince your CEO to give me resources if it's just about managing risk, because mm -hmm. as an aside, we're not very good at explaining and uh, tying like spend to risk reduction. Uh, but so, yeah, when I go to Dallas and I say, I think that we might want some regulation, there's a little bit more pushback than there is when I say that in Denmark. Uh, but uh, yeah. at its core, though, cybersecurity is, is a unique profession because we have to be technologists. We have to understand technology. And it's the same technology across the globe, number one. But number two, we also have to understand politics, geopolitical implications show up in our work every day. And so it's it's unlike a lot of other technolo technology roles. And we also, no matter where we are, we play the same role inside our organizations. We're not the ones building the cool technology that people want to buy. We're the ones trying to build the technology that manages the risks, risks of the new technology that everybody wants to buy. You know, it's funny because we were actually on a meeting call uh, earlier with Sean and someone, some company. We were talking exactly about that. Like, when you order to get the money, you need to get out it, and then somebody tell you that you need to spend the money, or yeah. you need. And then if you want to go to the big, you need a breach, and then you really get the money, which is kind of like you could avoid that by. I agree with you bring in a little bit more regulation in it because it's like, well, why should I do it? Because you have to. And I, I don't know if you can, I mean, you kind of confirmed that already, but that's the story I usually hear with the European community or Australia where it's a little bit more government driven, which again, I'm with you. For me, it's actually a good thing. I mean, not a hundred percent, but you know, it, it needs that push. Yeah. I mean, just like just focus on an example in the United States for a moment, uh, the difference between the, the financial services category where we don't have daily stories of compromises mm -hmm. of our large banks. And they, the, the, the people who do work in cybersecurity at, in those large banks will tell you they have too many regulators and too many conflicting sets of guidance, and they probably do. But the fact is that they have regulators who visit with them constantly who want to understand their technology environment who are tech technicians technologists themselves and so in financial services in the united states on average the security organization and the security spend is probably exceeding 10 percent of total technology spend at the organization compare that to healthcare where we've you know are probably our biggest and most painful security incident of of the last year for americans was the change healthcare and how it impacted people being able, able to get service and they won't say it on the record but i've talked to plenty of people in the healthcare isac who have confirmed to me that the typical budget in healthcare is less than five percent of technology spent what's the difference between financial services and healthcare both of them are critical services uh, that are foundational for protecting people, but one of them gets twice as much money for uh, doing cybersecurity and protecting us. That's all all about the money, perhaps. I don't know. Because <laughs> the other the other industry I think of, um, and it's not necessarily cyber, but cyber plays a big role in it. I'm sure is uh, retail, where there's a lot of fraud, and. My understanding is a lot of that fraud is just written off. So there's an acceptable amount and there's some controls to kind of keep that at bay, but th there's always some that, that just sits there and gets written off. 
John, that's a great point. I I've been I, I've never had the title CISO. I've always had the title CSO, and a lot of the time it was because it was always because I had more functions than just cybersecurity. And there were multiple times where I had responsibility around fraud. And let me tell you that the meeting with the CFO when I'm asking for my budget for my fraud prevention team is fundamentally different than my meeting asking for my cybersecurity budget. And here's how. It's this simple. When I go in for the fraud meeting, the CFO knows how bad our fraud is because of chargeback rates, because of the, there, there's a there's an maximum of a 180 day window in which you will know, and it's and it's typically much more compressed than that. Within weeks, you know whether you processed a fraudulent transaction. And so I, I remember the first time I went to the CFO and I said, look, if you give me $2 million more for my budget, I will save you $5 million in fraud. And the CFO said, if I give you 4 million, will you save me 10 million? Like they wanted to give me more money, <laughs> right? Have you have you ever heard of a CISO having that conversation? You know what that is called? Investment in security, right, right there. Right. It's the, it's but, the business of security, but it's articulating that number and yep. and not, not having any, uh, well, it's kind of like the cyber insurance as well. There's no actuarial data to say, this is what we see. Here's how you can do that calculation, right? Yeah, I think some uh, we're we're slowly getting there. Uh, like I have um, I have a friend who's at a uh, at a big PE firm in New York City, and uh, I was visiting him when I was there a few months ago. And yeah, the PE firm has a portfolio of companies, and every company has. Uh, cybersecurity challenges. And so imagine you have a portfolio of 50 companies and it's 50 evolving companies over 10 years. Maybe at some times you have 100. And, and this PE firm had been collecting data over the last decade from all of their investment companies about cybersecurity incidents and what cybersecurity tools they had in place. And they characterized every single incident. And they have a very disciplined approach to when they acquire another company, they go in and say, look, you must have multi-factor authentication implemented through a single sign-on. No ifs, ands, or buts, number one. Number two, you must have, and so they have a data-driven approach. Um, wish, I wish we all had that visibility and opportunity, um, but you know, we're on the journey and that's part of what we have to, as a security community, get a lot better at. <laughs> yeah, right. very cool. Yeah, I agree. I, I I could, as you probably know from one of our previous conversations, I could talk to you for hours. Um, we'll save that for when we're in person. You come from Sydney. I'll come from, from other states. We'll meet in person. We'll have a co longer conversation. Hopefully others do as well. Um, I invite everybody to... Uh, connect with you at the Australia Cyber Conference 2024. It is the first, what's the date, Marco? 26th to the 28th. There we go. Yeah. I had to get my dates right. Um, In the you, speak on the, you speak mm -hmm. on uh, the second day. You speak on that Wednesday. Um, I would encourage everybody to join your session, get a chance to meet you, maybe have a conversation of their own with you. Um, uh, you're, you're a good dude. Really appreciate you. Uh, you spending the time here and, and sharing your story and conversations. There, I know you do a lot of other stuff outside of right. So I'm gonna give well. you a couple of minutes to yeah. add to to the end of this in, story. In, important thing for humanity that you're doing, and uh, maybe share a little bit about uh, Friends of Ukraine with us, Joe. Yeah, thanks for that opportunity. And at at CyberCon next week, I'll also be uh, I'll be attending. They they have a um, CISO boot camp. And so I'm going to speak at that as well. It's going to be a smaller session just for security executives. Uh, I'll speak at that, and I'm going to try and attend that for the whole day on Monday as well. So it's it's a it's a really I, I think it's going to be a really good uh, few days uh, of activities. And yeah, you know, one of the things that uh, after I lost the Uber trial and I stopped working at Cloudflare, I started. Uh, well, there was one thing that I had been doing at Cloudflare that I really didn't want to stop doing, and that was uh, we had been asked in early. 2022 to 
to kind of help with the cyber defenses for Ukraine. And so after I, I left uh, Cloudflare, I reached out to a friend of mine who was the recruiter who had placed me at Uber and Cloudflare and said, well, you placed me at Uber, so you owe me one. Can you find me a, a nonprofit where I could volunteer for a bit uh, related to Ukraine? And he contacted me a month later and said, I found this nonprofit. It's, it's actually not cybersecurity focused, but, uh, but they need a CEO. And I said, wait, I wanted to volunteer a couple hours a week on cyber stuff. And now you're going to, you want me to be the CEO of, of a humanitarian organization. Long story short, I've been to Ukraine four times in the last 18 months, and I'm planning on another trip soon. And the main thing that we're doing these days is we're bringing uh, laptop computers in and setting up kids who are stuck in remote school, uh, especially kids who've lost a parent in the war and can't afford one. And and the, and the coolest thing about it all is that every single computer that I've brought into Ukraine and that we've shipped over, and I'm talking thousands of them at this point, every single one was donated from a company that I connected with through their cybersecurity team meeting at one of these conferences or when I've been speaking about cybersecurity stuff. I, I, if I get a little opportunity to mention at the end, uh, our website's ukrainefriends.org. And we, uh, like this, the cybersecurity community is all about helping people. And so I think we've got hundreds of laptops from three companies in progress of shipping to Ukraine right now. And at any given time, there's usually one or two companies that are boxing up. Uh, you know, those laptops that, if you've ever been inside a technology company, there's an IT help desk, and there's usually about five or 10 laptops stacked up in the corner before. Those things are gold. Uh, they might not be brand new, but you give that to a 12-year-old kid in a war zone, and it gives them an escape. It's not just connectivity to remote school, but it's like a it's a distraction from the tough stuff around them. So uh, the community has really helped. And can... Can people, I, I presume they can donate cash. Um, they can also donate as individuals uh, computers if you have them as well. And all that's on the website or how does that yeah. work? Yeah, every penny that we get donated, we put 100% into, basically right now, the only thing we do with cash is we buy cardboard boxes and uh, pay for shipping of laptops. When I travel to Ukraine, I pay for myself. I don't take a penny in salary. I, ha I haven't um, from the start. And we d we don't have any paid staff at this point even. Uh, so we just do it all as volunteers. And uh, the only expense we have is essentially shipping. You know, shipping laptops, uh, we want to do it safely and you know comply with all the standards so that uh, shipping isn't free. Uh, and so we do like cash donations uh, at, along with the computers. Very cool. Very I love, I love it. Guys are doing. Yep. I, I won't bring any with me, but I have a couple. Uh, I'm going to make sure end up uh, with you and uh, and with some cash to help help make sure awesome. they arrive as well. So, um, yeah. Well, and we'll, we'll obviously we'll include a link to uh, Ukraine UkraineFriends.org as well, so folks can uh, connect directly. Yep. Joe, you're you're amazing. Appreciate all that you do. Looking forward to seeing you at uh, AU CyberCon, uh, which is hosted by AISA, which is an Australian organization, also uh, government run as well there. Um, Mark, if you haven't kind of figured out, yeah, if you guys listening haven't figured out, we're going there. We're very excited. We're going into the future. By the way, the theme of the company is the future is now, so how appropriate. And uh, we're going to have so many conversations when we're there. We, we're planning. I think we're going to be super busy. We'll create a ton of content. So you should follow us on location with Sean, Martin, and Marco Cappelli, which is me. And we'll meet again with Joe and all the amazing people that are going to be there. Thank you very much. Yep. Excited for a few days. Joe, thanks a million. Safe journey from Sydney. See you in a few days. ThreatLocker is a zero-trust endpoint protection platform providing enterprise-level cybersecurity to organizations globally. With ThreatLocker, you only allow only what you need and block everything else, including ransomware. Learn more at ThreatLocker.com. We hope you enjoyed this episode of Sean and Marco's On Location event coverage conversations. 
please take a moment to give the show a good rating and leave a comment. Remember to share this podcast with your friends, family, and colleagues. Come back for more conversations and follow Sean Martin and Marco Cipelli as they continue their journey toward redefining cybersecurity and society.